Hey everybody, welcome to Ask Dr. Testosterone, starring Dr. George Tuliatos. Dr. Tuliatos is the author of Bodybuilding, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Excellent book. You can pick that up at his website, gtool.com, G-T-O-U-L.com, as well as Amazon.com. And now joining us all the way from Athens, Greece, Dr. George Tuliatos. Hello, Rob. Hello, Rob. Cool. Uh, this is number 16, right? Yeah, yeah, we're rolling right along. That's uh, 16 weeks worth of these, four months. Yeah. We have completed a full contest prep, as I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> okay. As a matter of fact, um, based, based on the passing away of Matt Porter, I visited my cardiologist and I had um, an ultrasound that is an echocardiogram of my heart. Yeah. And I was noticed that uh, my LVH is steady at 13 millimeters, but Perhaps there is a slight uh, increase in blood pressure, therefore I was uh, prescribed to use beta-2 blockers. The point is, I used the beta-2 blockers and I became severely hypotensive. Mm. My, my workout sucked totally. I mean, I was short of breath, I couldn't push it to the limit, of course, because it lowers the sub-maximal. But, uh, I mean, I felt drained and uh, almost fainting. It's very hot also here. Wow. But my, my blood pressure went down to 10 to 5 or 9 to 4. It was horrible to me. And perhaps it was a bit of stress that elevated my, pressure, my blood pressure to, to 13 to 7. Because usually, uh, regularly, I don't have a blood pressure over 11, 11 5 to 6, 5. Hmm. And um, what he suggested to me is, in case now you're, you're cutting off your beta-2 blockers, two things have to happen. Now, increase your reps and lower your resistance uh, weight. Yeah. Increase your cardio also yeah. and drop your body weight. Therefore, I have to drop down to, to 215 because I'm 220 now. Oh, so five pounds. Ten pounds, actually. Ten pounds. Okay, well, that's not bad. That's not too bad. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I have to go down to 10, 95 kilograms. Okay. Yeah, I have to increase my reps, of course, and don't push it to the limit because, frankly, I was uh, training like a maniac. Plus, I have some joint pain in the shoulders, in my elbows. And I have to adjust this and uh, until Christmas, so until the end of the year, and return back to 11 uh, millimeters, where is the upper range of LVH, of left ventricle, but you have better feet. However, this is something very regular uh, that all powerlifters and bodybuilders develop through resistance training, mm -hmm. but through the presence of G8 and AAS, this is increased also. Of course, there are worst cases of 15 mil millimeters, but, you know, I'm turning 46 next month, so I want to I wanna have things in, in control. You want to live to be 110 like Dr. O'Connor. What does he say, 120? <laughs> I can't remember. It's something ridiculous. Uh, can the, can the, when your, your left ventricle has grown like that, is there, does it ever go back to a smaller size or is that growth? Absolutely, absolutely yes. Okay. Yes. yes. One, one way is just quit training and do more only cardio. So the heart, um, the heart increases, gets thicker to, as, a, uh, as a result of the, of the resistance training, okay, because it's a muscle. Yeah. So assumingly you cut off, you, you quit from resistance training, yes, your left ventricle is going to diminish. The point is, to switch from six to eight reps or maximum reps, then to 12 to 15, okay, and develop resistance in strength. Hmm. So it has to also drop my five kilograms of my body weight. Therefore, there are some adjustments that they are life saving hmm. because in the long term, LVH may develop to increase in blood pressure or in ischemia or. So when you okay. say you have to drop 10, it's about 12, it sounds like that's about 12 pounds, right? Yes. Right. So does it matter if the weight you drop is muscle, fat, or combination of either? Does it matter? I think it's uh, both, but uh, I, I know that's going to be muscle. But I told that in, in the first place to my cardiology. He said, to lose what? You're not obese. Mm -hmm. And apparently, I'm going to lose muscle as well. But the point is to have less load and less uh, uh, tissue amount tissue mass that the heart has to supply with oxygen you know yeah that's why bodybuilders cannot run cannot jog in the first place because they carry more load yeah. plus their heart is developed thicker 
uh, unlike the marathon runners that it's structurally de uh, developed differently with larger ventricles that pump efficiently to the peripheries, how you train your body, you know. Mm. Cool. All right, well, we got some great questions this week. They all came yeah. in. They all came in the last couple of days, too, the good ones, anyway. Okay. Uh, so you guys know we get a lot of questions now for the doctor. Thank you guys for all the questions, but we pick and choose. We try to find the most interesting ones, the ones that are going to apply to the most people. Or just there are some very, very long ones that you need about five minutes to read. Yeah, I mean, guys, try to try to keep it short. I like a story. <laughs> I like stories, but we they don't really fit into this format. So number one, hey, Doc, I'm curious to know your thoughts on AI use, aromatase inhibitor use, and safety while on cycle for someone who's prone to gynecomastia. 6.25 milligrams to 12.5 milligrams every other day of XMS stain seems to keep the gyno at bay, but I'm fearful of the heart-related side effects. Hell, I'm even tempted to take something while doing my TRT dose of 200 milligrams per week because of the gyno sensitivity. Hmm. Okay, now, number one, uh, these 200 milligrams have to be split either to two times 100 milligram yeah. or four times 50 milligrams, not... 200 milligrams at once because it spikes the E2, crashes also SHBG, spikes free testosterone that also will aromatize. Yeah. Number one is this. Now, number two, it matters when do you drop your blood and make your calculation of E2 because we have also to follow the papers and the blood work, not just use aromatase inhibitors um, without, um, without evidence. Mm. Therefore, it's going to be different if, for instance, you use on Monday the 200 milligrams and you count your E2 the, the, the following day rather than uh, calculating your E2 the day before the shot. Hmm. Okay, so it matters uh, how many days ahead or before you have after the injection. Yeah. However, the protocol that is 50 milligrams four times a week, so it is every other day, contributes to less aromatization through this uh, avoidance of the spike of estradiol. Mm. Uh, now, about this dose, half of exemestan, because one pill of uh, exemestan is 25 milligrams. Mm. Now, just 12.5 every other day is a lot, it's very much. Mm. Therefore, I suggest half a milligram, which is 12.5 of exemestan, once a week for 200 milligrams is fair enough. But he has also not, not just go by clinical uh, apply and touch his nipples if they are sore, but he has also to calculate your, his beta estradiol. Therefore, I suggest him to use half of uh, aromacin once a week and um, split the doses in four doses of 50 milligrams, okay? 200 milligrams is a lot. It's, it's the highest amount of uh, optimization uh, TRT, you know? Mm. 200 is considered uh, the beginning of a cycle. Yeah. Uh, he has also see what is his free testosterone, his total testosterone, and mind that the free testosterone will aromatize. So if it's above range of free testosterone, it's more likely to aromatize. Mm. Okay. Question number two. What are the benefits of taking DHEA while on TRT? Currently, I'm taking 120 milligrams of testcipionate once weekly. Yeah, why? Again. Again, once weekly, better to be split, 60 twice. Yeah. Now, DHEA is produced from the adrenal glands. The point is, when you use exogenous testosterone, you're, you're shutting off this pathway from uh, the endogenous production from cholesterol, then to testosterone, DHEA, and whatever, steroid molecule. Therefore, we have to supply uh, with exogenous DHEA according to the SDHEA blood levels. So to my to my patients, when the SDA the SDHEA is below half, I suggest them to use 25 milligrams twice a day, AM PM. Now, if it's above half, only 25 milligrams, but also always accordingly to the to the blood work. Now, this is very helpful. Uh, of course, is an age management strategy, and you have to use DHEA as a part of the HRT over 40. But it's good for the immune production, the immune system, the self-esteem, the self-esteem and the cognitive function. Libido, of course, because as an androgen, it will elevate free testosterone, mm. and uh, it can also burn some fat because it's also metabolized to seven keto DHEA. 
And uh, yes, it's it's a productive and it's a helpful uh, androgen that is uh, sold uh, without prescription, right? You said you have yeah. your you have your hundred year old grandmother on it, right? Hundred and four, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. I also give it to my mother. I use it myself uh, three years in a row. Yes, it is helpful. As a matter of fact, before I started my HRT, it was very down, it was crushed. Hmm. Therefore, it means I, I, I needed that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Question number three. Does testosterone convert to DHT in a linear rate regardless of the total in free testosterone or is there a limit where conversion slows down? Do all forms of TRT have the same effects in regards to conversion rates and hormonal changes in the blood profile? Okay, uh, uh, the, the second part of the, of the question is no, because the skin and the scalp, so the epidermis and the scalp, yeah. they have more receptors of 5A reductase. This is the enzyme that converts D, uh, testosterone to DHT. Hmm. Uh, roughly, testosterone is a pro-hormone to DHT, and DHT is the hormone responsible for the all benefits of testosterone. Hmm. But also DHT is not a villain, of course, but it's not, it has positive and, and negative effects. Now, the, the negative effects are supposed to be the enlargement of the prostate, which is the BPH, the benign prostatic hypertrophy, hmm. nothing to do with cancer, okay? It's just the enlargement of the prostate and the androgenic alopecia or male pardon baldness. Hmm. Both of these uh, phenomena are also genetically predisposed according to our fathers. Hmm. And our mothers, the, the, the grandfathers, according to the, uh, the boldness. Hmm. Um, now, because of this fact, the transdermal testosterone will increase, obviously, the DHT production, rather than using testosterone from the mouth or orally or injectable. So and, the, uh, creams, the creams and the gels are much worse at the DHT? Yes, curve? and some people, some people also have developed be more edgy and more grumpy with the cream hmm. and more horny also. Oh. Because DHT spikes, but what is more important to, to see is the intraprostatic DHT and not just to the periphery, the serum. Yeah. Therefore, if you want to uh, focus on the prostate, you have to calculate the, the, the DHT within the gland. This is something different. Hmm. But when I was using the cream, my DHT was 1,500, which is way above. And people have told me that they were, they were more angry and more, uh, more um, you know, they, they were more nervous related to the, to the injection. Mm. Were you? Uh, I don't remember now. I cannot. Uh, Should have asked those people. Was I, was I a big jerk around this time? But, you know, maybe they won't remember. Okay. It, uh, now, also I have to, to, to say that the free testosterone is responsible for, for the aromatization. And because it's the 2% that, that liberates, uh, that is free, it's bound free, it's unbound from the SHBG. Yeah. Therefore, I guess that it's a matter of free testosterone, the aromatization, the DHT production. Because today I had at the office one case, there was a boy with a total testosterone of, of 800, but no libido. Hmm. And he was, his SHBG was above 100 because he was following a ketogenic diet, hmm. while his E2 was very low. So... Total testosterone does not tell the truth always. Hmm. We have to see what is lies beneath, which is the free testosterone that is also um, uh, um, social link is uh, affected from the SHBG, okay? Yeah. Also prolactin affects libido and E2 as well. But uh, we have to, to look the whole panel. Hmm. Was, was his free testosterone very low? Yes, because uh, it was super high, his SHBG, so I couldn't let free his free testosterone to work. Hmm. Wow. So isn't there a drug, isn't there one of these drugs that, that uh, frees up? The, the, the Proviron and the DHT also. Okay. Two androgens, Mesterolon, which is synthetic DHT. Masteron does the same. And as a matter of fact, all, all AAS do this thing. Okay. Hmm. More, it's the DHT derivative, Primobolan, Winstrol, and Anabar, Masteron and Proviron. Okay. And DHT also helps. Okay. And of course, it carbs every three hours because tanking the insulin will, this is the paradoxal of endocrinology, that very low insulin will elevate the SHBG. So, in two words, carbs will make you horny. <laughs> okay? That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, next question is very important because trenbolone is so popular. 
everybody and their grandmother here is on trend. So the question is, I notice when I use Trembolone that my appetite crashes hard. I have almost no desire to drink water, have to force my daily consumption to stay hydrated. I've tried altering my doses, higher trend with lower testosterone, higher test with lower trend. I do better as far as side effects with lower test, higher trend, but either way, I still have no thirst or appetite. Wondering what could this be from and how could I change it? Okay, uh, when I was reading Anabolic's book when it was first published two years ago, I read the ASIH, the, uh, the Anabolic Steroid Induced Hypogonadism by Dr. Thomas O'Connor, and he said whenever you're using 919 nor testosterone derivatives like, uh, like Trembolone and the Nandrolone with that Trembolone is the derivative of Nandrolone, you should have the ratio between testosterone and the, and the steroid 2 to 1. Therefore, 500 milligrams of DECA or TREN and 1 gram of testosterone. This is for proper libido, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they're supposed to shut off the HPTA because of the prolactin uh, production, okay? Yeah. And, uh, of course, uh, this is favored when aromatization exists from testosterone. Now, this guy says the opposite, that he uses, for instance, one gram of trend and a half of gram uh, and a half of gram of testosterone, which is apparently wrong for his sex drive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Trembolone is also very androgenic, okay? And maybe it drive you crazy, high doses. <laughs> yeah. Now, about the first part of the question, when I was talking to Peter Van Mol, the big cat, the big cat yeah. he passed away uh, last year, mm -hmm. he was from Belgium, he was a genius. In, in steroidology, he told me very, something very important, which is which that exists, and I also described it in my book. Trembolone is very anabolic for two reasons. Of course, it has a tremendous anabolic index. Also, it suppresses the catabolic cortisol. Now, cortisol is a glucocorticoid. What is supposed to do? Elevate glucose through gluconeogenesis. If we crash on cortisol through very high anabolic steroid use, like, for instance, Trembolone, hmm. we have a hypoglycemia, and this is what Peter told me. You're using Trembolone, and you have a slight hypoglycemia, and then hypoglycemia drives you appetite, okay? So, I guess, uh, Trembolone does not uh, make you, uh, I mean, if it gives you, through this mechanism, a hypoglycemia, it's supposed to stimulate appetite. Yeah. Yes, yes, this is, uh, and also another thing, prolactin uh, is elevated after ejaculation. Prolactin is also linked with increased appetite, okay? Therefore, uh, I guess prolactinemia is also linked with increased appetite, and this is what DECA is supposed also to do. And DECA works with higher calories as well. This is my assumption, and this is my speculation about the, about the trend. And um, now, I don't know what he said, he, he becomes thirsty. He's not thirsty. He doesn't want water, doesn't want food. This is really strange. I've never it's heard weird this. because Fren also is supposed to stimulate uh, BMR because it builds muscle, yeah. thermogenesis also because you sweat, and uh, increasing basal metabolic rate also is linked with increased appetite. Right. Hmm. This, yeah. is my, this is my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard. I've never heard about that side effect from Trembolone, where you have no appetite and no thirst. Have you ever heard anything? I've heard. I've heard of, however, I, I, I heard of uh, having a slight fever. Yeah. And feeling kind of a uh, sick and this kind of heat. Yeah. But tired, okay. and this is maybe uh, due to the to the crash of cortisol because cortisol is supposed to be anti-inflammatory, and you have less recuperation without cortisol. Hmm. Then you feel kind of fatigue. But uh, not hungry, I don't know. Yeah, this guy might, you know, might have something else going on that he's not aware of. Who knows? I, I wouldn't just blame the trend, would you? No, no, just this. No, of <laughs> course. Maybe he uses also Ekastak. So, I don't know, or amphetamines. Right. Okay, it's time for an Olympia-related question, Doctor. You could solve the mystery of the Mr. Olympia. Poor diet and lack of exercise can lead to weight gain in the form of visceral fat. So why would Phil Heath have this to lose? Are, because are he abuses insulin. His nickname is Phil Suline. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. He allegedly, allegedly abuses Oh, come on, man. 
Come on. Saying. We can't, we can't. Uh... This, this 3D pump is based on insulin mm. because all the food rushes into the muscle. Okay. And uh, you're not flat during diet because of insulin. And he, when, when I, have, I saw a video when Phil trains, he has always um, a carbohydrate solution near him. Uh, that means because uh, I guess he, he used insulin pre workout. Right. Well, I guess that, that, would make sense. that would make sense. But I, and we know that insulin leads to a metal fat accumulation and production, and this is how you get the bubble gut. In second, in second uh, thoughts, you have the visceral development from the G8, but this is, takes long. Hmm. But uh, the metal fat accumulation, which is the greater momentum, which is a layer of fat covering all the viscera, uh, it develops through insulin. Not just through food, but also injectable insulin. This is the side effect that makes you bloated. Plus, it, it leads to edema and um, you know uh, sodium uh, accumulation and bloating. Uh, but this is the, this is the reason. Yes. So there are two types. There are two types of fat inside. There's visceral and what was the other one you said? Alimental. No, no. Um, or mental fat or visceral fat, the same thing. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Now, in in, a, in a human anatomy, we have the greater and the lesser momentum, which is a fatty layer covering all the viscera with blood vessels and nerves that nourish yeah. all the viscera in, inside the, the abdominal cavity. Now, this elevates also with drinking beer, and the, the, the mental fat is the nasty one that leads to interleukin-6 or tumor ne necrosis factor and insulin resistance. Hmm. This is, of course, developed with a junk food, trans fat also, and leads to insulin resistance and through injectable insulin. This is the fat. So my, my idea is to use metformin along with growth hormone in order not to develop the mental fat accumulation. Though this was my suggestion to Phil Heath last year hmm. with Milos to quit insulin while dieting yeah. and use instead metformin, alpha lipoic acid, vanadyl sulfate, chromium picolinate, and berberine in order to manage the supposed insulin resistance from the go hormone. Yeah. But will that take, will that, will those, everything you just rattled off, would that reduce the visceral yes, fat? Yes, if you fast, fasting also, it's off, cuts off the metal fat, you burn it. Oh, because I mean, you can't fast when you're a bodybuilder, you're always eating. Uh, listen, it, when you're dieting, you, when you're dieting, you're supposed to cut off the calories, okay? Yeah. 7,000 calories, you go to 350, to 3,500, Eating 1,000 calories, seven meals, you get uh, the half of it, okay? It, it just seems crazy that somebody can be 2 3% body fat on the outside. Yes, exactly, yes. And there's still fat all around yes. the organs inside. Yes. That's crazy. Yes, it's crazy, yes. <laughs> but it's true, I guess. It's very paradox, yes. Wow. And, and it's, not uh, gonna go, it's never going to go away unless you do that drug cocktail of the metformin and the... All and also, you, you, you lower your calorie intake. Well, can't do that if you're trying to be 250 ripped. You know, you got to eat. <laughs> listen, listen. 250 ripped means that you were 280 uh, off season. Right. So this drop of 30 pounds uh, will have a. But I, I told uh, my, my opinion was Phil to get down to 240 when he was in 2011 mm. in order to have this kind of shrink. Yeah. Uh, he looked awesome in 2000, 2011. He was just about perfect. Yeah. Okay. Fine. It's not about how big the dog is, but how hard he bites. <laughs> this is Samir Benot told me. Well, I have a shit to and she's missing mo most of her teeth, so I don't think it applies in her case. Let's see. My last question for you, doctor. My question is, when it comes to aromatase inhibitors, by taking Arimidex or Aromacin, will these free up more testosterone and increase muscle growth, or do they just suppress estrogen? Obviously, when taken with AAS, I don't mean alone. And if I say you're trying to bulk up, would you be better off not using them because estrogen has benefits for growing? Thanks. A good question. Now, if you use a aromatase inhibitor alone, it's supposed to elevate your endogenous testosterone production and free testosterone, as Thomas O'Connor also said, through uh, lowering estrogens, and this will trigger GnRH from the hypothalamus. Okay. So this is an indirect mechanism, and then it will stimulate your uh, LH your uh, total and free testosterone. Now, when you use it along with steroids, it's supposed to lower your estrogen. Now, estrogens take place also, they're very basic. Uh, they're, uh, there is a fundamental basis of muscle growth through estrogens because, number one, they give a greater affinity for an anabolic uh, receptor, for uh, androgenic receptors. 
This was demonstrated by castrating rats. And now the castrated rats, obviously they cut off the testicles. Now no androgens, super high estrogens. Yeah. Then they administrated the, an anabolic steroid and the affinity of the steroid to the androgenic receptor was 500 more higher. Hmm. This was, this was uh, in anabolic 10th edition and in 11th edition by William Llewellyn. Number two, steroids also increase the muscle glycogen synthesis. Estrogens, I'm sorry, increase the muscle glycogen synthesis because the muscle gly glycogen is a part of water retention and starch. Therefore, estrogens are linked with water retention that also along with carbs will form the gl muscle glycogen. That's why crashing on E2, we're going to make you flat. Hmm. Number three, and we know also that muscle glycogen is linked with muscle strength and performance in lifting. No glycogen, no pump. And number three is also because you have more, more water retention in your joints. They are lubricated through this water retention. Therefore, they're not aching through uh, heavy lifting because off-season is linked also with heavy loading. Hmm. Uh, of, so, and another important thing, uh, when you have higher estrogens, you favor of IGF-1 in the liver. Hmm. Now, lowering estrogens and tamoxifen lowers IGF-1 in the liver. Therefore, you should not use tamoxifen during off-season because it's supposed to lower your gains. Hmm. Because uh, tamoxifen uh, has dual effect. Half is estrogenic and the other half is anti estrogenic just like the serums. Hmm. And abusing aromatase inhibitors during off-season and bulking is not a good idea because you need, of course, the, the presence of the estrogenic environment and I have written an extensive article on anabolic org about it. Uh, therefore, you should focus on having an estradiol higher than regularly during uh, HRT, for instance, or during the cutting phase. Mm -hmm. You should not be so much obsessed and maniac about your E2. Of course, to be too, too digital, be, be below 100, but not to be so super obsessed and uh, uh, paranoid about it. And it doesn't matter if you are a kind of watery during the season, right? Yeah. You're not going to get your shirt off. So, yes, um, uh, I, I suggest to use it, for instance, if you use one gram of testosterone, your E2 can be uh, just below 100 and use three milligrams per week of anastrozole. Not every day. Okay. okay. They say that semestan is more friendly to the lipids. It is not going to crush your HDL. Some. I have tried it and I have, so, I have not observed any tremendous and uh, significant difference. Hmm. Uh, but you need, estrogens are a friend during off-season. Yeah. Besides, the more anabolic pills are highly estrogenic, dianabol and anadrol. Also, testosterone and DECA and equipos, we use them during the off-season because we have this bulking effect. We don't use dry drugs like Primo, Winnie, or Anavar during the off-season because we need this water retention. Yeah. And also for the other reasons that I, I, I told you. Okay. Excellent. Well, that has been episode 16 of Ask Dr. Testosterone. Thank you, Dr. George Juliados, for taking Welcome. the time. And uh, guys, keep the questions coming. Do try to keep them, you know, kind of short, to the point. Because we, we don't always need uh, your whole life history. It, whatever's helpful, whatever's relevant, of course. But, uh, you know, we do appreciate the great questions. Keep them coming. You can post them in the comments under the videos. We'll find them that way. Or you can go to musculardevelopment.com and the Nobel Forums. But uh, typically, if you leave them in the YouTube comments right under the video here, we will see them and we will get to the, we will get to the best ones. So please keep them Maybe going. we can have a, a short part to the magazine of the show. Maybe we, have, we can have a small contribution there. I mean... Uh, we'll see. Well, we, we, got your, we got your column every month. I, I neglected to mention that to everybody. Every month you can see Dr. Tuliavis' column in Muscular Development Magazine. So that's more Dr. T for you. Because uh, I know some of you guys want more, more, more. And we're happy to give it to you. So, Doctor, thank you for your time, your knowledge, your expertise, as always. And, uh, guys, thanks for watching. Please keep watching. And we'll see you next time.